Um, my name is Manuel Santa Maria. I have the, the privilege of actually uh, working in the Community Impact Division, which actually oversees uh, grant making, scholarships, strategic initiatives, um, also nonprofit support services for the Community Foundation. So uh, I, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new ones. Thank you for coming. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quick sort of intro why the Community Foundation is doing this training. Um, I, I actually sat down with Cheryl Conti, who's going to be doing the presentation about maybe a year, year and a half ago, and we talked a little bit about, you know, what, what's happening in technology, um, how artificial intelligence is actually shaping our realities. Um, and as we talked uh, about a year and a half ago, one of the big things that you know we saw obviously in the November 2016 election was everybody saw and heard the uh, Facebook uh, ads, the Twitter bots, and uh, the conversation about how these things actually affected our election. And so we got to talking, and you know one of those big state, national, and federal uh, uh, initiatives and projects that's coming down the pike is the census. Census 2020 is super, super important for everyone, right? We want everybody counted because it means that we're going to get billions of dollars into our counties for hospitals, for libraries, for schools. And so it's really, really important that we get out there and count everyone. But then when we started talking with Cheryl, you know, we kind of put those two together in terms of what the Community Foundation was interested with the census and artificial intelligence. And we said, it, this is going to be an interesting moment in time because we've got not only automated laser fishing, uh, we've got human puppets, um, never mind the bots, that's like, you know, really easy stuff. How about some astroturfing? Uh, and how is that going to affect the way that we communicate? We're going to get lots of misinformation uh, about what the census is or isn't. Um, we get lots of misinformation about any, any, any um, important project that we're all working on. So as we sat down and as we talked, we said we need to actually get this information out to the community, to the nonprofits on the ground, which, which is you guys. You guys are on the front lines. You guys are working on this every single day. So it's really, really important. The agenda for today is going to cover a lot of sort of level setting for folks, but then in the afternoon, we want to get you sort of thinking and, and actually working together to think about what your organization can do, should do, and what we're also interested in is what happens after today. If you're interested, if you want to get more specific and capacity building around this particular issue, we're going to be sending out a survey afterwards, but we want to hear from you because this is really, really important. and. You know, for me, when I talked to Cheryl as well, it was sort of, you know, anxiety, you know, uh, sort of increased the anxiety level for me because it really is kind of crazy what's out there. And if we're not paying attention, we're going to be the victims of more stuff. So one of the things that I said to her is like, let's put a little bit of fear and anxiety uh, as, as she presents. <laughs> Be and you should know that you know when we met with Assemblyman Berman, who is the uh, chair of the California Complete Count, you know, Census Committee, and he saw this presentation. It actually spurred him to actually think about what we could be doing at the statewide level because this is really, really important stuff. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cheryl Conti and to Adriana. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Manny. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Thanks, everyone. Can everybody hear me OK? I'm going to try to be mobile. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, the agenda is going to change a little bit in the afternoon uh, just to make sure we get through uh, the content. We're going to move the exercises towards uh, the end. If for some reason we don't get to them, we have handouts, uh, so you'll be able to take them with you. But we want to make sure that we have plenty of time for dialogue, um, for questions and answers. Um, so that's going to be uh, what drives us. Uh, we are recording today. Um, so just to let you guys know, if for some reason um, that's going to be an issue for you, just let us know, um, and we can work around that, OK? Uh, all right. Uh, without further ado, let me pull up our agenda here. Mm. 
Boom. All right. First off, I want to introduce myself, but I also want to tell you how inspired I am by all of you. You know, all of you have chosen uh, in your work to serve others, you know, and to help others lead better lives. So thank you for all you do today, and it's an honor to be here speaking with you. Uh, so who am I? I'm Cheryl Conti. I'm the CEO of Do Big Things. Do Big Things is a digital agency that uh, provides new narrative and new tech for the new era that I think we all sense that we're living in. So we do everything from email and social media fundraising uh, to strategy, uh, digital audits, uh, content development, uh, but also deep uh, digital infrastructure development. Uh, we have uh, amazing developers, designers who can build anything, including apps uh, and websites. Uh, we work with causes, campaigns, and companies who have mission-driven uh, initiatives. All right, and a few foundations as well. All right. So. As Manny previewed for you, I'm going to break it down for you, all right? It's the, the web has changed. I think we can all sense that. Uh, and, you know, I want to talk to you today about what's next on the Internet and how to prepare, because there are people who are working counter, essentially, to your aims to educate, enlighten, and uplift, unfortunately. But that's okay. We are much smarter than them. But first, let's take uh, a look back uh, at the 2018 election. And what, are, what can we learn from that? What, what are some trends that might be relevant to understand about uh, what's happening? So the midterm voter turnout in 2018, we haven't seen anything like it in over 100 years. Uh, it double digits in many states. Uh, it's the largest since 1914. So what happened in 19, what was going on in 1914? That, yeah, World War I. Uh, it was actually not just World War I, but you know, essentially the collapse of the feudal era, right? And the move to you know, the democratic uh, era that we see today. So you know, people were energized, they were organizing um, for change. So we're living through another dramatic period in which people are engaged civically. We also see that online influence really matters. How many of you know about online influencers and what that is? A few of you, that's good. So online influencers are individuals online who have significant followings. Uh, you know, people you know, want to follow them on Instagram or they have a YouTube uh, channel. So I don't know how many of you have seen the Fire Festival documentaries. Uh, and you might say, well, why is Cheryl recommending that I watch that? Uh, and I never thought I would say this, but the Hulu documentary is actually far superior to the Netflix documentary. That said, I mean, if you like Ja Rule and you want more Ja Rule in your Fire Festival documentary, you should watch the Netflix one. However, if you want to understand, you know, the seismic shifts in our society and how Fire Festival, it, you know, connects and is an example of that, you know, how the internet has changed, I, I recommend the Hulu documentary. You know, it's really about the power of online influencers to shape the events. And look, you know, it, an online influencer has translated that influence into becoming the president of the United States. So why is this relevant to you? Because online influencers in communities are going to be really important for getting, you know, reassuring people about the census and for encouraging them to participate. The other thing I would point out to you is from Pew Research, this is very fresh data, that shows that you know whether right leaning or left leaning, people uh, Americans do understand that the internet uh, is a really important place to share information and to organize around civic issues. This is particularly true of younger people who tend to lean left. But as you can see, you know it's at least 10 percent, and in some cases, you know almost up to almost close to 50 percent of people who say, you know, I actually use social media to encourage others to take action on issues that are important. So, you know, we are recommending that particularly around census that folks adopt a digital first mentality because that's where people are going to find information and share information about this. 
Uh, another thing that we saw, you guys are smart, I'm not going to read what's on this uh, what's on this slide, but you'll also receive access to these decks after this. So don't feel like you have to scribble notes. None of you are taking notes. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Some of you are taking notes, but we'll have these for you. What's really important to understand about what happened in 2018 is the erosion, uh, the attempted erosion, and in some cases successful, of um, people's ability to vote and people's ability to actually participate in civic action. And again, around the census, there are people who want to do the same thing, who want to actively not just discourage people from voting, but discourage people from participating in the census. And you know, we can't achieve policy goals unless people are able to, you know, there's there's being willing to vote and then there's being able to vote. So, you know, that's something that we really, uh, you know, have to take a look at. And, you know, you can see in 2018, we sent a car sized rover to Mars and it took selfies. And yet there are black and brown people who had to stand in line for hours to get access to broken voting machines. Okay, something is very wrong with that scenario. And we've, we've actually done quite a lot of work on stuff like automatic voter registration and what have you um, around the country. Uh, other greatest hits, uh, we found that, you know, can, we worked with, again, causes and candidates. Uh, and we found that, you know, video is the new killer content online, people want to share it, uh, people want to make it, but also all of the social media platforms now have optimized their algorithms to promote video. So that's important to keep in mind. And we, we saw that in terms of just very simple, straight to the camera candidate videos where candidates talked about their stories. Those were the best fundraisers. Very simple, on an iPhone. And in fact, Instagram, I'll, I'll touch on this later, but Instagram executives will tell you that video shot on an iPhone or an Android, simple, clean, performs 30% better than any other video that you're going to take. So you don't, need, you don't need to be a Final Cut Pro expert. You don't need to be Steven Spielberg. You just need to pull out that iPhone or Android. Uh, so uh, persuasion can't start too early. And of course, you guys are the smart ones. You're here. You're already getting ready. But in terms of you know, getting out there and encouraging people, the earlier you start, the better before their opinions start to solidify. right? And then it gets harder to move them. Uh, and then you know, how you build your lists, whether it's email or social, matters. You know, if you're uh, spamming people, if you are, you know, being chicken little and the sky is falling, you know, ultimately, you know, that's going to burn people out. So you want to build as authentic a relationship with your supporters and also show that you're listening to them as possible because that's going to help not only keep that list, you know, alive, but also help it grow over time. And we found in terms of the election, how you treat your supporters matters. Who remembers John Ossoff? Anybody? Yeah, you don't even remember who that dude was. He was very hot for a minute in 2016, but uh, you know he was running for office for Senate, but now nobody remembers him because he didn't actually keep you know, his supporters engaged and alive on social media. In contrast, Beto O'Rourke you know, has Instagram storied his dental appointments, and now he's running for president. He was able to, you know, keep his supporters engaged and active, even as, you know, he even though he lost uh, to Ted Cruz in Florida. Uh, and finally, investing in storytelling really pays dividends. Uh, and again, I think for the work that you guys are doing on census, being able to share real people's stories about why the census matters in terms of the funds that it can bring to their community uh, and you know, the, you know, the political ramifications. You guys probably know better than I do that California came within 19, one nine people of losing a member of Congress, even though our population is growing. So those are the stakes that we are facing. Uh, so where we're going, uh, I don't want to dig too deep into this uh, just because we have a lot of content. But you know, as we said, you know, persuasion is really important. Uh, ads, doing even low dollar digital ads is critical right now. Again, you know, these social media companies are publicly traded, and they have optimized their algorithms to promote not organic content but paid content. And so you've got to be 
you know, out there competing. It's, you know, it's a battle out there for, for eyeballs. Uh, Personality-driven social media. I know that you guys, you know, probably traffic a lot in facts and figures and, you know, very serious professional content. And nobody wants that, okay? Like, people aren't here for that anymore. Like, that's obvious now, unfortunately. Okay, so, you know, you're going to have to, you know, build up, you know, the identity, you know, of your spokespeople and of your community, you know, supporters so that people engage as real people. Um, and then finally, there are tools out there that can help you, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we get along. Uh, finally, the rise of younger women's voices is very much a trend that we're seeing. Women over-index on social media. So it's a, it's a powerhouse for them. Um, women tend to vote more than men. They tend to be the people who encourage others uh, to take action, whether it's go to the doctor or vote or participate in the census. Uh, and so you know, it's, it's really important to observe the different uh, ways in which um, younger women and you know, potentially tap on those as influencers in your community to be you know, some of your leaders out there. So. I'm going to actually zoom back out a little bit more to 2016 because what happened was uh, a lot of fake news. So there was a point in time right before the election when there was actually more fake news on Instagram, I mean on Facebook, than there was real news. Yeah, that's, that's pretty unfortunate. And some of this content, by the way, comes from the Shorenstein Center at Harvard. I've spoken there in the past, and my good friend Nico Mele uh, is the leader there. Um, so I recommend it uh, for you know, getting more information. So how much fake news is out there? This is information from Pew, uh, Pew Center. Um, most Americans are confused about what is real and what isn't on the internet and about 25% at least know for a fact that they have shared fake news, whether on purpose or by accident. So what's happening? You see there's a lot of lines going down and one line going up. That one line going up is actually internet publishing and web portals. Every other type of publishing is on the downslope in terms of just you know, sheer number of people even just doing that job. So, you know, the people who used to provide factual information, there are fewer of those in the traditional uh, venues. So into that void has come fake news. But why, you ask? What kind of person would share fake news on purpose? Well, the Shorenstein Center actually has done a lot of research on this. They dug really deep. And what they have found is that there is a rich diversity of assholes <laughs> on the internet, OK? So some of them have shared fake news just for the lulls, just because it's fun, just to see what would happen. Uh, a lot of people did it for money. You know, a lot of what drove, uh, both in 2016 and 2018, a lot of it was, you know, there's a financial you know, uh, incentive, or was, uh, for providing clickbait. Right? and just getting people to click. And then, of course, there's, you know, as we know, there are you know, active nefarious forces who were doing this for propaganda or for political influence. I'm one of the few folks in the nonprofit world who get invited uh, every year to F8, which is the Facebook developer conference uh, just down the road in San Jose. Uh, and so last year, you know, Mark Zuckerberg had a lot of fast talking to do about you know, how they were going to, you know, clean this whole situation up. And so you can see here that you know, they are working hard. They say they're working hard to disrupt financial incentives. Um, they are using machine learning and AI to try to find hoaxes you know, where they come up um, and uh, using actual human fact checkers as well. And this is, of course, not just a problem for them in the United States. They're actually working, they are working with the Associated Press uh, across the 50 states to try to get a hold of some of the fake news. But they're also, you know, working on this, you know, for, uh, across dozens of uh, countries. You know, and they say, this was back in 2017, I'll get an update, you know, in uh, a couple months uh, when I go back to F8 on how they're doing. Uh, but uh, they say that this has created so far at least an 80% reduction 
in uh, the fake news that they're tracking. What that did cause, though, for those of us who are working on it, there's a downward pressure for everyone particularly on organic news, just because of the way that they've changed their algorithm to try to intercept. So, you know, that's been a real issue um, for all of us trying to get content out there. So, now we're getting into some of the real interesting stuff. This is, Man this is Manny's favorite stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> some of this work comes from my friend Aviv Ovadia, who, Dr. Ovadia, who is a leading researcher on uh, the dark future of the internet. How many of you watch or have seen a Black Mirror episode? Yeah, oh, quite a very sophisticated crowd. I like it. So for those of you who are uninitiated, uh, Black Mirror is uh, a BBC, but now available on Netflix. It's a BBC program that uh, sort of extrapolates on the near future of technology that we use, consumer technology that we use every day, and then spins it into how could that go sideways for just a person's life, right? Like what are the what are the ramifications? It's pretty disturbing. It's our modern twilight zone, but for those of us who are technologists, it's actually required viewing. I have to wait, like I can only do one every few months because they're so, they're so I'm sensitive. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I recommend, but this is a little, you're about to get a little taste of Black Mirror right here, um, the crib notes. So, um, so I'm gonna play this short video for you. Enjoy. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or Ben Carson is in the sun complex, or, how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, See, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. <laughs> this is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. Stay woke, bitches. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome for that. Uh, let me get out of here. That's on the internet. That is on the internet. Yeah, you can find that. Uh, so that was um, our friends at BuzzFeed collaborated with Jordan Peele uh, to do that last year. As you know, Jordan Peele has a new even more disturbing movie out called Us um, from Get Out, which I, I it's going to be a while before I see that because um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sensitive, like I mentioned. Uh, but so how was that created? What, what are human puppets and what is deep fake? So uh, until recently, it was mostly Hollywood um, who were the most concerned about uh, human puppets, uh, the phenomenon where, you know, essentially you paste over, you, you, it, it looks like someone is saying something that they didn't actually say. Um, they were worried about that because, of course, you know, their stars are their brands, right? And if someone, you know, puts some crazy stuff into Morgan Freeman's mouth, that could actually impact his ability to make movies and therefore studios to make money off of him. However, obviously now we're living in a new era where doing this kind of thing is increasingly easy. So how was this made? Uh, via Adobe After, After Effects, readily available software, uh, and Fake App, which is an artificial intelligence program. It uh, was actually used originally to transplant uh, Nick Cage's um, vo face into several movies in which he hadn't actually appeared. Uh, so uh, they actually pasted Jordan Peele's mouth um, very cleverly over Barack Obama's mouth um, digitally uh, and then replaced his jawline with one that kind of moved with uh, Jordan Peele's. Uh, it took uh, about 56 hours um, of processing to do this. It's pretty, it's still pretty intensive for computers. However, computers are getting faster, the software is getting better, it will be a lot easier over time to do this, which then leads to, you know, what if you know, someone uses deepfake 
to, you know, you know, and analyzes, you know, tons of footage of, say, Donald Trump or Kim Jong Un, and and you know, then has them spit out a realistic sounding statement that o would only have to be good enough, right, to trigger some kind of reaction. Um, so, you know, the scientists are calling that diplomacy manipulation. But there's more. Uh, so polity simulation. Uh, polity just means people, um, if you're not familiar with the term, but essentially uh, Ovadia calls this a dystopian combination of political botnets and astroturfing, where you've got political movements that are manipulated by fake grassroots campaigns. So, you know, basically you've got AI-powered bots that search the internet uh, and compete with real humans uh, for legis for your attention, right? For legislators and for um, policymakers' uh, attention, no matter where you are on the ideological spectrum, most people think that net neutrality seems like a good idea. Yeah. However, the FCC, with the administration change, they wanted to change um, the policy here, uh, and uh, in pursuit of that, uh, they had a comment period, right? Um, but 7.5 million comments were filed in favor of overturning net neutrality um, that actually came from 45, only 45,000 distinct email addresses. And they were all generated by one single fake email generator site. About 400,000 of those could actively be traced back to Russia. Someone was trying to make it look like Americans didn't want net neutrality. We caught them this time, right? What if you have a scenario in which very realistic AI bots are starting to comb, you know, the data files of San Mateo County and filing fake census applications, therefore making the census useless because what's what? Who knows what's actually happening there? Yeah, it's grim. I, I, Manny told you he tried to warn you. <laughs> uh, then there's automated laser fishing. Um, automated. So some of you may remember the movie You've Got Mail. Right, it's very romantic. Where Meg Ryan and um, uh, what's his name? Tom Hanks. Hey, Tom Hanks. There you go. I, I know you guys are awake. Uh, where they, they're, you know, they're using AOL. It's sort of quaint now, but they're sending these emails back and forth, you know, and they build this love affair, and then they finally meet in person. Well, what if Tom Hanks? was getting messages from, you know, he maybe got a couple of messages from Meg Ryan, but then a fake Meg Ryan really starts to, you know, amp things up. Someone who had actually analyzed automatically using, you know, AI to essentially impersonate her and start to um, send messages. Again, you know, it's taking the whole Nigerian prince e email to another level, where it's not a Nigerian prince, maybe it's your brother or your mother, right? Someone who you care about and who very much sounds like you. It's, it's, you know, easy, it's not as easy to detect a fake. It's not misspelled, right? It comes from their email address. It sounds like them and all of a sudden they want money or they're telling you to not fill out the census. Um, you know, these phishing messages are getting increasingly more sophisticated. So, uh, you know, what you then have is a shared reality that starts to become eroded. You know, and that's what the alt-right has been saying, that the news is all lies. But what if your inbox becomes half lies, you know, half true? What if your the census becomes half lies and half truths? You know, it starts to then erode, you know, the the fundamental basis of how we actually do do business uh, in America. And that can lead to something that um, Ovadia has called reality apathy. You know, and by, by set by just a torrent of misinformation, people start to give up, you know, and tune out. And this has actually happened in other countries. You know, there are countries where, you know, they know, you know, like North Korea, they know that the news is all lies, and so they just tune out and just try to get through the day. They, you know, and, you know, our whole system, to a certain extent, is underpinned by stuff like freedom of speech and freedom of the press, by, you know, an educated populace that is able to self-govern because they have the information to do so. Without that, without the essential information required for functional democracy, it starts to become unstable. That's what we're facing. So, whether we like it or not, 
Americans get their news online. We, you might not like that fact. You might be like, that's wrong. <laughs> That Americans, that most Americans get their news from places like Facebook, but that doesn't matter, okay? What, you, what we want doesn't matter. We have to deal with what's actually happening. And this is particularly true among, you know, what are going to be the hard to count, right? Whether it's, you know, where it's, you know, you know uh, among uh, younger people, uh, you know, whether they're non-white, whether they're less educated, you know, it's even a, a bigger deal for them you know, in terms of using um, the, the social media to get their news. And yet, Americans don't trust the news for, for good reason online. Um, you know, they say that they see news and, you know, a majority of Americans have seen inaccurate news. At the same time, even though they don't trust the news, uh, people are still using social media, right? Social media use has, is actually going up, even in the wake of Cambridge Analytica and other scandals. Millennials have the most trust in social media sites, and again, this is going to be an important audience to mobilize, um, particularly in, in hard-to-count areas. Americans also don't trust the government. Uh, this is going all the way back to Dwight Eisenhower. And you can see, even, to, even though you know, your preferred party may or may not have been in power, people generally, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, trusted their government. Today, again, even if your preferred pow, you know, party is in power, people, you know, there's been a precipitous drop in trust in government. And you know, just to bring that home, people really don't trust the government. Uh, you know, the trend is actually accelerating over time. And finally, Americans don't trust organizations like yours. Okay, I know some of you represent the government, but some of you are nonprofits. Uh, this is a study that was done by Georgetown University uh, a few years ago, in which they asked, you know, where where do you get your news about charities, about causes? Uh, only 20% said that they got it from an organizational website. 65%, where that red arrow is, said they got it from their friends or family. Okay, and so that's the energy that you have to tap into. People aren't going to trust you. They're not going to trust an enumerator who comes to their door no matter what kind of t-shirt or badge. That might even turn them off. The people that they're going to trust are going to be their, their local influencers, particularly those online. So now you might be saying, dang, Cheryl, now what? That's bad news. What? Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, so <laughs> here's the good news, okay? Even though, you know, people, trust has been eroded and people un are uncertain, social media use is encouraging. And what I have said to folks, you know, since the 2016 election is the main reason, one of the reasons the Russians were able to impersonate grassroots groups online is because the real grassroots groups weren't using Facebook and Instagram and Twitter effectively, okay? And so there is an opportunity for you to surge in with more information, right? Part of it is just volume, given that this is, you know, it's integrated increasingly into people's lives. You can and should ally with these influencers. Um, they're actually pretty important. Uh, 40, uh, sorry, 92% of people trust recommendations from influencer over ads or celebrity endorsements. Even if you get Cardi B, you know, or Jay-Z, you know, to say like, hey, in San Mateo, you've got to do the census, y'all. Like, people are going to tune that out. It's more important for them to hear from their neighbor, right, that they're taking the census. Like, that's what people want. And, you know, the for-profit companies, we're surrounded by them here in Silicon Valley, they've known this for some time. In Internet influencer marketing is a it, it is slated to become a ten billion dollar industry in this nation. Okay, it is uh, there. Are, there's a whole ecosystem of consultants and influencers and apps and websites, uh, all geared towards influencing you to buy shoes. You can tap into that to encourage people to do the census. 
Uh, here's uh, from Olapic, which is one of those companies I just mentioned that traffics in influencer engagement. Uh, you know, uh, here in the United States, an influencer is roughly defined as someone who might have 10,000 followers, but for community engagement, it might be lower. It might be a few hundred, it might be a few thousand. That's still important, right? You know, the, they networks are, are built upon other networks. Someone might have a thousand followers, but you don't know who's following them, right? You want to get into that concentric circles of influence, particularly within a community, but it's also a global phenomenon. You know, in Germany, uh, it's lower because it's a smaller country. They define an influencer as 50,000 folks. Um, you'll see there where it says uh, 55 to 61 year olds. Apparently there is a generation that just doesn't, that is still clued out of what influencers are. Um, and uh, that's really important to understand that you may have to go back to your organizations and educate you know, some of the you know, people in your office about you know, how important this is. So let's talk about uh, the century that we're living in. The mainstream media as we know it is going away, okay? Yeah, again, like I don't love telling you this, but we have to deal with the facts as they are. So this is the number of newspapers in just the last 20 years, okay? And there's, like, that is trending to zero eventually, right? There will be, like, a couple. There will be the New York Times, maybe the Washington Post, and a bunch of blogs. That's it, okay? And so, you know, if, you know, the people who are going to win this century are those who create their own podcasts, who create their own YouTube subscriber channels and create their own Instagram followers. And that includes you, okay? If you're relying on the media to help get the word out and save you, okay, that, that strategy, as I was telling Manny, you know, uh, during the warm up, I went to business school, I have an MBA, and one of our strategy professors at Georgetown said, look, hope is not a strategy, okay? Putting stuff out there and just hoping people find it and pick up on it, hoping that the media is going to help you get the word out. Like, this is not a strategy anymore, unfortunately. Uh, this is from Lila King, who actually manages uh, news and publishing. She's an executive at Instagram, and she said, look, you know, don't take for granted how excited your followers would be to receive a response on Insta from your org. You know, too many organizations, even, you know, uh, government organizations, they see these uh, social media platforms as broadcasts. Like, we're just going to put it out there and we'll just see what happens. But that's not how it works. It's really about creating that dialogue, which means that you have to reconfigure your staffing and your strategy in order to account for that community management for answering questions right for seeing that someone has retweeted and that person has a lot of followers you want to start a different dialogue with that person because they can help you in a whole other way as an ally to reach an audience that you might struggle on your own to reach but it's very meaningful for them to be recognized by someone like you right Uh, what This is actually information from South by Southwest. Last year I spoke at uh, South by, uh, which is a big uh, interactive conference uh, in Austin, Texas every year. Um, I didn't go this year, but we have uh, a team down there. One of our clients is NBC Universal, uh, and they have a whole campaign around Erase the Hate. Um, and so they actually have a big program, so we have some team members down there. But last year they really worked hard at Instagram to try to educate people on the fact that, you know, Instagram is checked 25 to 30 times a day on average. Yeah, how often are you posting on Instagram? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the fastest growing platforms, particularly for some of these hard to count initiatives. You know, you don't want to be a raindrop in a thunderstorm. That's part, again, of the issue that we're facing is that there is a volume issue. Like, you have to shout down the people and shout out the people who are trying to pump the internet full of misinformation in your county or your locality around the census. Uh, for those who are, fashion is the most developed vehicle um, on Instagram, those, those followers tend to check up to 50 times a day. Um, and people follow 500 to maybe 1,500 accounts on average. Why would they follow you, right? If you're bored by your content, okay, what do you think everybody else feels? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just keeping it really real. We already talked about the engagement and performance on content. So, you know, just to start to close up here, um, this is, you know, rumors are sticky. Rumors meaning also fake news, right? Like that's out there. So it's really important to make the truth louder. Corrections backfire. Saying stuff like, oh, the census isn't, you know, going, you know, the INS is definitely not going to cut track you down if you do the census. Like, yeah, what do you hear when you, you know, what do people hear about that? They hear ICE, they hear INS, right? Um, you know, or say uh, a great example is Meghan Markle, right? Meghan Markle, and uh, everybody knows who that is, right? She's one of the royal family in Britain. So, you know, she and Kate Middleton, the future Queen of England, apparently have been beefing. Um, and so that's been a big story for a while, but all of a sudden, you know, instead of saying like, oh, we're definitely not fighting, we definitely don't hate each other, which they obviously do. Uh, <laughs> instead, it's like, oh, look, Meghan Markle's having a really star-studded baby shower in London, in New York. Right? It's creating a different narrative. And so that's really important for you guys. You know who's the king of creating a new narrative? Donald Trump. Okay? Whenever the news looks bad, he will flip that script in a minute. There's something to learn there from, you know, how to shift gears, you know, for you guys. And finally, source credibility. You know, trust has is at an all-time low and people trust their friends and family and their community influencers the most they probably don't trust you and so that means you have to find seek out and ally with the new tribal leaders which in many cases are going to look like online influencers in your community so what are a few top takeaways uh, there are some new tools um, that can help you. We'll talk a little more about that. Oh, did I? No, I, I think we're good. Um, there are new tools out there that can help you, and we'll talk about some of those um, in the afternoon that can help you. It, if, I know your teams are small. I know you don't necessarily have tons of resources, so how can you be as compelling as an online influencer and zhuzh up your content a little bit uh, to make it more compelling. Video is the killer content. And again, it doesn't have to be fancy. In fact, it shouldn't be. The fancier you make it, the more people will suspect you're the Russians or ICE, <laughs> right? So, you know, you want to get out there in the, in the community and get just, you know, pull out that iPhone and start to get video of why the census is going to transform communities in a positive way. Uh, you know, influencers can make a big difference. Don't try to defend yourselves. Just create a new conversation. You've got to pump content out there. You know, uh, for Instagram, they recommend, think about it as breakfast, lunch, and dinner at a minimum, right? Three times a day, right? And you can schedule this stuff. It's not that you have to be tied to your computer. You can actually schedule content to be going out. That doesn't excuse you from doing some real-time analysis of what's working, what isn't, how do we shift strategy. But, you know, there are tools now that make it easier than ever just to make sure you're pumping, you know, regular so that you are the thunderstorm, not the raindrop. And then finally, you know, a lot of you are going to have to start to think about your paid ad strategy. Digital ads are not that expensive, honestly. You know, it, they, it, they're relatively cheap and yet you can reach hundreds of thousands to millions of people with a relatively modest budget. Whatever you guys are thinking about in terms of printing out pamphlets, okay, forget about it, okay? A waste of your time and money. Put that money into digital ads and see what happens. All right, so uh, with that, I think we uh, have some time for questions and answers. Yes, we have half an hour. Yeah, we've got half an hour. Thoughts? Yes. <clears throat> Great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you start? I mean, honestly, you can start by looking at who's following you now, right? You know, pull out your, you know, you can see all of your followers. Start to do an analysis of who's following us now and who has the most followers. I would say most of the organizations we work with haven't even taken that. And these are, in some cases, very sophisticated organizations. They have no idea who's following them. They have done zero analysis. And they don't know who among those followers of, your, of the followers that follow you now have the most followers. That is a great place to start. 
Um, then, you know, another thing that you can look at is, you know, who's taking action now? Who's opening, if you're sending out emails, who tends to open those most often? Right? Those are your super, those are your super activists, your super supporters. You know, then do an analysis on those folks, look them up online and figure out, okay, who among those have a significant <laughs> following or on one or more social platform? And finally, you know, the internet is your friend here. You can actually just start to search for, you know, influencers in San Mateo County. You'd be surprised that probably someone has done this information. Or if you just type in, you know, hashtag San Mateo, see who's using, you know, hashtags that are relevant to your county or your city and see who pops up first and start to actually analyze. We call it, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it in the afternoon, but we call it the landscape analysis to start to understand what's actually happening. What does the conversation look like online now? You know, and who's dominating it? And how can you ally with those people if they are people worth allying, right? What we have started, we're actually doing quite a lot of work and analysis on the national front on census. And as I said, there are people actively working to make it uh, scary for people to, to fill out the census. Great question, though. Yes? So we're the census coordinators from San Mateo County. We'd be really interested to know if you could compile examples of what you're just talking about, census-related, bad messaging, fake news, something that we can use to discuss with a larger audience. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know that we have any actual snapshots of that, but we do have some. Uh, we, we're going to talk in more detail. We've done a, a landscape analysis um, with the help of Silicon Valley Community Foundation. So we have at least some initial findings of, you know, what's happening, you know, in California right now. But yeah, there's work to be done. I mean, this is some of the work that needs to happen now to understand, right, what's happening, you know, who. But I can also put you in touch with um, the data and society team. They actually came, Dana Boyd and her team um, came uh, last year. To here uh, at Silicon Valley Community Foundation. They've done a ton of research. They know a lot about all of the garbage out there. So I'm happy to connect you also with them because they've done a lot of research on this. Yeah, but it's it's not hard to find, honestly, unfortunately. Yeah. So kind of a follow-up to that, if there are folks thinking about this at the national level, um, the thought that came to my mind is, yes, we can figure out who our local folks are. But it's around messaging, really, because um, if we want our truth to be louder, and we want to control that narrative. How do you do that when you've got folks at the national level working on this, at the state level, and the local level, right? How do we make sure that those voices are in harmony <laughs> across the board? And it's, it's also hard to control the voices because the influencers are going to say what they want to say. Yeah, and you should not try to control them, okay? Like trying to control influence. As I personally have t over 10,000 followers on Twitter myself. So, like, I am an online influencer. People pitch me personally all the time, right? And I can tell you, I don't pick up everything. You know, it's just not, you know, I got to roll how I'm going to roll. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, I had a train of thought there girl and now it's gone. Um, yeah, there are a lot of, dia there's a lot of dialogue right now about messaging um, on both the national and the state level. I know that, um, Manny, did you want to talk to some of your dialogue and connection with the national initiatives that are happening? Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at, like, um, like Cheryl said, is, is not necessarily controlling the message, but who, who is out there actually putting a message out? which we don't necessarily know or didn't know, you know, regarding the, the census. So at the national level, you know, there's a, there's a consortia of, of philanthropic institutions taking a look at where do we invest some dollars to actually do that landscape? Who's actually, you know, being the loudest and what kind of message are they putting out? And I think that, you know, over the, hopefully over the next maybe three or four months, we're going to be able to share some of that information with local folks because it isn't like you said to control it or sort of you know orchestrate it, but what is the message that's going to you know sort of reverberate or be most useful here in these two counties or in the region? And there's you know we, we they helped us do a quick landscape study of, of this, and we, we'll share it with you uh, if you leave us. Up, I, I think we've got everybody's email address, so we'll share that because it, it is really very interesting as, as far as who's putting information out about the census. <clears throat> and you'll, you'll see it, that it's very, very easy to actually do uh, on your own. And I know some of this stuff so sounds daunting because you know we don't necessarily have a six-person social media or communications department, but I, but I think just being and thinking you know, strategically about 
how do we time it, how do we do it, if you only have one person, you have maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, how do we actually think about this? Uh, but we'll share that information as well with you. Absolutely. Thanks, Mandy. So I picked up my train of thought, which is, yeah, you can't control influencers. That's that's just not how it's done. Instead, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, you want to, you know, give the information, you want to you want to give the influencers the resources and then ask them to put it in their own terms, put it in their own words, because that's what's going to be most authentic and persuasive. And that's what I do. You know, I get pitched all the time. And what I do is, OK, here's, you know, here's the sample tweet. But here's what I'm gonna. Here's how I'm gonna remix that a little bit so that it, it actually feels authentic to people who act, who know me, right, and know how I talk. So, but that is different. I know from how a lot of folks are used to, you know, sending out a press release or like, you know, we want you to send out this very carefully calculated statement, and that's just not the world that we're living in. Again, Donald Trump is a great example of that. His team really tries hard to get him to read the stuff on the thing. And what he understands works for him is, you know, to put that in his own language. He literally is an online influencer. And if you want to understand how that works, you know, he's a good example, you know, a very public example of that at this point. And that happens on the, the miniature level as well. Great question. More questions, yes. So Bay Area is particularly vulnerable for a lot of reasons, as we've sort of seen. Um, has anyone thought about Golden State Warriors uh, as influencers, strength in numbers? It really sort of ties into the complete count piece. I think Steph Curry would be an awesome spokesperson. Yeah, Steph Curry, or even better, Aisha Curry, OK? Aisha Curry is actually the one that you want. But then, you know, an, another way to find influencers, who's following Aisha Curry, right? Who lives, you know, in your localities and has a lot of followers. Like that's a, you know, a way to find. And, you know, again, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth of, you know, how do you find influencers? You know, who are, you know, what, what kind, how do they behave? What do they want? You know, but one of the things that we're finding is, um, you know, you want to you want to cultivate that relationship, um, particularly with women. You know, women. You know, over-index again, and uh, you know the fashion and lifestyle bloggers online. You know, who have the YouTube channels. You might say, well, you know, they they talk about this other stuff, but look, they get pitched on yoga pants and diet tea all the time. They're actually everyone is engaged right now in what's happening in the country they're dying to hear from you to put up something else that you know that isn't about that and they can influence their audience in a different way they can reach a whole group of other people who aren't watching cnn who aren't reading the local paper in a different way can you talk about how you'd actually work with one of those influencers is if it's do they do it philanthropically do they do it pro bono or are you paying them especially when it's something that benefits the community like how, how do you approach them Things have shifted. Um, a lot of them are willing. We actually did during the election um, a campaign uh, with Open Society Foundation where we were encouraging black millennials to vote. And we partnered with um, one of the very big and popular influencer networks called Upfluence. There's a whole bunch of them, Neofluence, Hive, et cetera, where they actually have essentially stables with of influencers and giant databases where they then pitch they do a, a sub segment they pitch those and then they see okay who from this pool of influencers is actually inf you know interested right and we offered nothing we said look we just want you to reach out to your audience and encourage them to vote okay we got nothing for you uh, we actually had strong pickup again people want you know, to they're really in, engaged um, right now. They want to be helpful. You know, but we notice less of a pickup than we would have in prior years. You know, the influencer game. You know, there's you know, you guys get paid to do your job. They feel like they should get something to do their job. However, I would say you know, a small gimme, right? Like a sticker, right? A mention, a T-shirt. Right, like it doesn't have to be big, but you probably, for best results, you may want to offer them something, a cup, right, just some kind of gift that you know entices them a little bit more and maybe converts a few. A lot of them will do it for free, just you know, again because you know they want to be helpful um, and they they understand the importance. But some of them may need a little bit of a sweetener these days to get on board, just because right now they just get so much. Uh, let's have, I know, I know you've got questions, but yeah, let's get a few more. 
I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more of a how-to in terms of pitching influencers, because it's, you know, most of us know how to send out a press release, right, like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. But if we're not um, really sophisticated on social media, we might not know, like, the how-to of, of doing a pitch like that. Absolutely. We're going to get into that a little bit more, and we actually have some exercises in the afternoon to practice a little bit. Um, but absolutely, you know, we get it. But to a certain extent, look, bottom line, you know, as someone who's also an online influencer, I'm a human being, okay? Talk to me like I'm a person. It's, it's just not that hard, you know? Like, don't send me a press release. Talk to me like, you know, and you can use, you know, mail merge or whatever. Like, you can still automate it somewhat. But, like, you know, put it in, you know, how would you talk to me in person? Put that in the email. Put that in the direct message on Twitter, right, or on Instagram. Treat me like a person. Try to have a conversation. Don't just tell me to do something. Ask me. Other questions? I know you had one. I did, and it was sort of related to what Georgia was talking about. So we, a few weeks ago, saw that Ariel Winters, who's on Modern Family, had put out something about Census 2020. And so we saw that as an opportunity and retweeted it and kind of tweeted back at her, right? We're still learning all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question would be, so if someone, we do this landscape analysis, we see that there's someone out there, and maybe you'll cover this in the afternoon, but so how do you not just retweet them, but then engage them for the longer term to continue to be that champion or that voice? Yeah, so it's great that you retweeted um, and hopefully said something like, not just retweet it, but thank you, mm -hmm. that's great. Uh, you know, did you follow her? I did. Okay, great. Uh, did you notice whether or not she followed you back? She did not. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> you are the county. Which is, yeah, you are the county, so it's like, this is not that sexy. But you could, you know, you could keep retweeting her, right? You know, obviously keeping it relevant, but like, you know, you've got to get on the on both her radar and her team, right? Like understand that particularly for these bigger celebrities, like it's not just them doing it, it's their team. You know, keep an eye on her stuff. And if it's even tangentially civically, you know, motivating, being like, hey, it's great. And we love, we also, you know, remind her, right, that that happened, that you retweeted. Um, and, you know, try to reach out to her team behind the scenes. You know, you don't have to just go through Twitter. You can actually look up and figure out, okay, who... Who, who manages her? Who's her agent? You know, can we actually try to reach them via email and say, hey, we love your tweet. Here's, here's the real dope about the struggle, okay? <laughs> we could really use Ms. Winter's help because it's bad. I mean, look, you know, the thing about, though, you know, Hillary Clinton is a great example, right? She had all kinds of people on stage with her, Jay-Z and Beyonce. Who wouldn't want them, you know, telling people to vote? And yet it did not help. Right? People trust, celebrities now are also like institutions. People don't trust them either. They don't necessarily trust their motives, you know, unless they're like Cardi B and are very, you know, very authentic, right? Like Cardi B is given, you know, she's suiting straight, okay? <laughs> she is unbought and unbossed, to quote Shirley Chisholm. Uh, but unless you've got that kind of reputation, to a certain extent, these big, big influencers, they're hard to get at. Okay, like, you know, they may not be on message. And Ariel Winters doesn't live in your county, right? Like, you know, for her, it's just like, yeah, that's cute and cool, but I don't, you know, this isn't, like, if she heard from, you know, L.A., if she's living in L.A., that's different, right? Because it's impacting. Instead, again, you know, you want to actually reach down a couple of layers and figure out, okay, who in our, you know, vicinity is a big dog barking, right? Because they're going to be easier to reach out to, they're going to be, you know, probably easy to find. Like, I'm pretty easy to find on the internet, partly because I'm an influencer for professional purposes, right? So I want people to come and find me. Ariel Winters does not want you to come find her, okay? She's doing her, her thing. So instead, reach down a few levels and find the ones that are actually most relevant to you. Great question. Yeah, because you can spend a lot of time chasing, you know, after these big lights when there are a lot of little lights that actually are going to shine brighter for you for this specific purpose. Other questions? Yes. I, um, and I don't know if this is a question for you or is it a question for the organizers or at the federal and state and county level about 
Um, uh, so we're talking about these fake messagings and things like that, and it will. Uh, I'm just thinking about it, and I think it's going to affect uh, different communities differently, uh, depending who the players are, the messagings, and things like that. Um, is there, uh, if you can share any best practices, any thing that we can uh, do to help the people know what to look for, how to avoid fake messaging, uh, or um, even if there's like a centralized uh, hub of information where um, they can trust more, because um, the federal website, sometimes it gets too dense. So something a little bit more um, everyday level, but a trusted, reliable resource that's available in different languages that people feel a safer route to get to. Something like that, just to throw it out there to think about best practices and how can we facilitate something like that. We're not gonna get in depth on that today, just, you know, we only have so much time, but that could be a great next, you know, 201 uh, training on, you know, let's, let's really dig into um, search engine optimization, you know, how are you social media, um, monitoring you know what that looks like let's get more hands-on and you know let's strategize around how can we you know centralize and then disperse among you know the different uh organizations um, again you know part of it is filling the feeds right so having one central like you know a lot of organizations get into this mindset of like yeah we have a digital person like that's just not that's not the world we're living in everyone who touches the public in your organization needs to be out there creating content that is touching the public, whatever their audience is. There is uh, content being developed on the national level um, that is multilingual. So, you know, I think that hopefully we'll find ways to make sure there's, you know, a way to get access to that, you know, especially as it gets updated, as the strategy refines and shifts, you know, and disperses. And Anne, isn't the CA Endowment Foundation creating a hub locally, more locally? A communications hub with messaging and information but it's I don't think it's available yet it is not available yet to my knowledge but you know again you know we're gonna you're gonna need more than one you know hope is not a strategy hoping that someone creates this thing you know is not the strategy again you know what can we do together you know to actually you know both generate and share the resources that we have amongst ourselves great question other questions? I know it seems daunting. I see a lot of concerned faces in the room. You should be worried. Okay, that was the whole point of this conversation. However, the afternoon, you know, after lunch, we're going to dig a little, we're going to really roll our sleeves up um, and provide, you know, not only, you know, some overview of where things are, but also some very practical uh, strategies and tactics and you know we're gonna have some exercises where you can actually start to get in there and and apply um, this for your uh, locality